Father, what a privilege it is to meet with you, to sing praises to you, knowing that you inhabit the praise of your people. Lord, you are honored at Grace Bible Church. We seek to set you high on your throne, even with all of our weaknesses and faults and failures. You instruct us in truth of your greatness, and we simply respond to it in giving you glory. Lord, as we study the Scriptures, might it be a marvelous time where your living and active Word reads us. Help us to understand where we stand with you and that we would respond in lives of worship and adoration and service. For Christ our King, we ask it. Amen. Well, dear friends, I'd like to continue in another sermon on life in the Spirit, part two. As you join me in Romans chapter 8, our next set of verses would be verses 5 to 11 as we continue to unpack life in the Spirit. The Spirit of God is highlighted in chapter 8 of Romans. Spurgeon explained, quote, The Spirit of God doubtless illuminates the intellect and guides the judgment, but this is not the commencement nor the main part of His work. He comes chiefly to the affections. He dwells with the heart, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. And God hath sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts. Now the heart is the center of our being, and therefore doth the Holy Ghost occupy this place of vantage. He comes into the central fortress and universal citadel of our nature, and thus takes possession of the whole." Unquote. So as the Spirit has taken up permanent residence in the life of the believer, we are starting to see what it looks like. It's not a life characterized by the flesh any longer, but characterized by the Spirit. So we want to continue to look at the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our exposition, Life in the Spirit. Life for the believer is marked by fruit that the Spirit produces, not works that the flesh can produce in the lives of unbelievers. Throughout this chapter, we could appropriately ask to each of us individually, what would be different in your life were it not for God the Holy Spirit resident in your life? What can only be explained by His presence. Do you see Him working? Said differently, what are the fruit of regeneration and the Holy Spirit's residence in life of which you can take no human credit for and that points to Him being resident in your heart? There's a lot of things that people point to when they talk about how they're saved and why they believe they're saved. But in our conversations, are we talking about the expressions of our heart that only the Spirit explains? Jonathan Edwards used that phrase, religious affections. That's what we're talking about here. In Galatians 5, Paul talks about the fruit of the Spirit. So I guess in, in uh, the Apostle Peter's words... How diligently have you been to make your calling and election sure? I think a fatal flaw encourages us to be careless about our Christianity. Just doing little, achieving little, and yet we can securely go to heaven when we die, which is so diametrically opposed to the life lived. I think we need to circle back around to what Paul has already addressed. There in, our, in our text today, there's only two groups, two categories. I don't remember how many weeks ago we uh, addressed the fallacy of the, the perpetual carnal Christian. 
that somebody can say that they're saved and there being no fruit of regeneration of the Spirit's presence in their life. How can that be so? That decimates the gospel. <clears throat> How can the church have slipped so far in our day as to think that it can live like the world and still go to heaven? I'd even ask the question, why would they want to go to heaven because it's nothing like their worldly experience? And yet this comfortable teaching of the perpetual carnal Christian gives you the best of both worlds. We can sin here and be assured of heaven too. It doesn't get any better than that. So we think. Well, for the first time in Paul's letter to the saints at Rome, he does give us a careful definition of the carnal person. And the carnal person is not a Christian person. It occurs five times in verses 5 to 8, the first section of the paragraph we are considering today. I want you to notice the contrast as we read the text together. Follow along as I read for us. Romans 8, beginning in verse number 5. And actually, I'm going um, to start in verse 4 because it's, uh, all of it's tied into that. Paul had just mentioned that we are those who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And that flesh versus Spirit is what this next paragraph from 5 to 11 is going to unpack for us. Verse 5, For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Notice that contrast, death and life. Verse 7, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, it does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, Though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Beloved, understand the clear contrast between a life of the flesh and a life in the Spirit, so that you might be moved towards the Spirit's ministry. We've only got two main points, and verses 5 to 8 gives us two categories, two classes. There are those who are of the flesh and those who are of the Spirit. And like I mentioned, the reason why we included verse 4 is because of that little word for at the beginning of verse 5. It ties this whole section of verses 5 to 11 into what he just said in verse 4 of us who walk, who conduct our lives. And the question is, what is characteristic of that walk, that life? Is it the flesh or the spirit? It's not both and. And there are four important contrasts between those two classes he talks about the thinking and the state and the religion and the present condition. Notice again in verse 5 the, the thinking. Those who are characterized as according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. Now let's just stop there for a moment. Dear friend, what do you set your mind on? What determines the direction of your life? Is it the flesh or the spirit? Paul talks about the mind. The verb form of mind is here in verse 5. Phreneo, it means to think. He's asking, what are you thinking about all the time? 
Is it fleshly thinking or spiritual thinking? So it appears in verse 5, and then the noun from Nehemiah, verse 6 and verse 7. So since the verb is in verse 5, and you're, when you're studying Scripture, the verbs are where the action is. It is something that is active. It's the conscious intent and in making of choices. Throughout the day, throughout the week, throughout the month, throughout the year, what are you thinking? Now, the believer, or the unbeliever, who is a slave to sin, has to obey sin because it's his taskmaster. He's bound to fleshly thoughts. No inner power from the Spirit to set him free. They only know flesh without spirit. Notice what their mind is set on. He said their minds are set on the things of the flesh. Things of the flesh. Now, that sounds a little vague. You know, when, when we were learning preaching in Bible college and seminary, uh, you want to be specific. Don't use vague words like things. Well, Paul uses the vague word of things here, things of the flesh. It sounds vague. So, take your Bibles and turn them over to Galatians 5, where, if you'd pardon the pun, Paul fleshes out what he means by things of the flesh. Galatians 5, Scripture interprets Scripture, Galatians helping us understand these things of the flesh. Galatians 5 and verse number 19. 519, now the deeds of the flesh are evident, Paul says. He says it's apparent. It's as obvious as the big fat nose on my face. It's evident. What are they? Immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing. Now notice this, things like these of which I forewarn you just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Things like these. In other words, Paul's not giving us a complete list of the things, the thoughts of the flesh. This is just a sampling in one of his laundry lists of sins. Does that characterize you? You know, the word practice is crucial because even saved, forgiven sinner, uh, uh, forgiven Christian sin, we commit sins, but we don't practice them without repentance like we used to do as unbelievers. Is this your practice? Is this what characterizes you? Paul says, it. if so, then you will not inherit the kingdom of God. He makes it clear and unambiguous. But of course, in, in Romans that we're studying, as you turn back there, in Romans, he hasn't been talking in terms of the kingdom of God, but he has been turkin, talking about death and life. You know, if we are, since we're born into Adam's family, Adam only knows sin and condemnation and death. And so we need the last Adam to adopt us into his family where there is life and no condemnation because He took it upon Himself in the flesh on the cross. So the first contrast is in unbelieving thinking, things of the flesh. How about the state, letter B? Uh, and by the way, I ought to remind us, you notice how that these are not commands of conduct. These are simple statements of reality. This is what is true. So he says, those according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, things of the Spirit. Verse 6, for the mind set on the flesh is death. Flesh equals death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Now remember back in chapter 6 and verse 21, what benefit were you deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed, for the outcome of those things is death. You know, when we 
came to Christ, and we, we look back like, oh, those, those sins used to be pleasurable. Well, they're a bunch of liars, you know. Uh, we've been changed. It wasn't, we weren't driving a whole lot of benefit. All it led to was our death. Later on in our chapter that we're studying now in chapter 8 and verse number 13, if you're living according to the flesh, you must die. But if you're living by the Spirit, you are putting to death the deeds of the body. So either we engage in the flesh and die thereby, or we put to death that sin as believers do and experience life. What we need to see here is that the unsaved person is, unres- as, is as unresponsive to the things of God as a corpse is. You know how I've mentioned to you before, I've done dozens and dozens of funerals in the uh, over three decades of ministry, and nobody's ever complained about how I've done their, done their funeral. Why? Because a dead man can't respond. That's why Paul uses the inspired metaphor here and elsewhere in his epistles. No response. Understand the spiritual metaphor of deadness, whether it be in Romans or Ephesians. David reveals to us that creation is, the heavens are telling the glory of God, Psalm 19.1. Well, the unsaved sees the same sunset and the beautiful creation, the omnipotent power of the Creator as the believer does. But he doesn't respond. He doesn't see it, nor does he care. When you come to special revelation of Scripture, the Bible, concerning these truths, he can't understand them or else they seem foolishness to him. Remember 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural man doesn't receive the things of the Spirit of God. It's foolishness. Neither can he understand them, for they are spiritually appraised. The state of the fleshly one is death. No response. Martin Lloyd-Jones relates a classic case of this lack of spiritual understanding in an incident from the lives of William Wilberforce, the man who led the movement to abolish slavery throughout the British Empire, and William Pitt the Younger, who at one time was Prime Minister of England. And this will illustrate what we're talking about, about this, this blindness, this spiritual death of the fleshly one. Pitt was only a formal Christian, a Christian in name only, whereas Wilberforce was the real deal. But these two parliamentarians were friends, and Wilberforce was concerned for his friend's salvation. In those days, there was a great preacher in London whose name was Richard Cecil. Wilberforce thrilled to his ministry and was constantly trying to get his friend Pitt to go. You've got to listen to this guy. Just come once. That's all I care about. Well, he finally comes, and even though Pitt kept putting Wilberforce off, at last, by many invitations, Pitt agrees to go. And Cecil, the preacher, was at his best, preaching in his most spirited manner. Wilberforce was ecstatic, like the preacher's really on today. He couldn't imagine anything more enjoyable or wonderful than hearing these words of God's truth drip off his lips. It was ecstatic. He delighted that Pitt was with him. But as they're leaving the service afterward, Pitt turned to his friend and said, You know, Wilberforce, I have not the slightest idea what that man has been talking about. Clearly, Pitt was deaf to God as if he were a physical dead man. That's what Paul is talking about in our text. No spiritual eyesight, no spiritual hunger, just death. 
Thirdly, how about the fleshy one's religion? I understand that it might sound odd, but everything is religious. Even atheism is a religion. It's against a religion and rebellion against Creator. Notice verse 7. The, the mind set on the flesh, Paul says, is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. So, friend, don't err in your thinking that if you have not actively bowed the knee to Christ, that as an unbeliever, you are not committed to rebellion against Him. There is no in-between ground. Either you're a slave of Christ Jesus or you're in hostility, an enemy toward Him. Paul says here that the, the fleshly ones are hostile towards God. It's very clear. It's the religion practiced against Him. That term, extra, enmity, being an enemy of. We would read uh, Galatians 19 to 21. What are these things of the flesh? Well, one of them is this enmity that characterizes a life of the flesh. This is the only work that the flesh can accomplish, not the love which comes as fruit of the Spirit later on in Galatians 5. <clears throat> James gives us some eyesight here as to this enmity, the, the hostile religion towards, towards God. In James 4.4, 4, <laughs> uh, this is not very politically correct when he says, you adulteresses. James says, you adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility with God? It's not neutrality. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Either you're a servant of God or a servant of the flesh. Cranfield said, fallen man's fierce hostility to God is the response of his egotism, which is the essence of his fallenness to God's claim to his allegiance. Determined to assert himself, to assert his independence, to be the center of his own life, to be his own God, he cannot help but hate the real God whose very existence gives the lie to all his self-assertion. His hatred of God and his rebellion against God's claim upon him expressed in God's law are inseparable from each other. As a rebel against God, he hates God, and as one who hates God, he rebels against Him. That mind of our fallen nature, its assumptions, its desires and outlook, etc., which is enmity toward God is also unsubmissive to His law, and indeed by its very nature is incapable of submitting to it. Now, we understand that even the Christian struggles in constantly bringing all of life under Christ's lordship. That was Paul's pain in the previous chapter, wretched man that I am. What I want to do, what God's law teaches I ought to do as out of love to the Lord, I don't do, and I keep going back to these wicked practices. So, he'd made it clear. In other words... Believer, though you still have rebellious thoughts, you've at least got the sword of the Spirit to wage war against our rebellious wills that we despise, which the fleshly one does not have access to. Now, if you are a guy in the church that gets some texts once in a while, um, I'd sent out this week a, an exposition by Dr. Steve Lawson from 1 John 2, where he's preaching on love of the world. I think the title of his sermon was, When Love is Wrong. There is wrong love when it's love for the world and not love for the Lord. You could even call that sermon, The Love That God Hates. Because either you love God 
or you love the world, you cannot love God and the world. They cancel each other out. Well, in that sermon, I, I think it mentioned it was Dr. James Montgomery Boyce who used this illustration of the seesaw effect. So with 1 John 2 clearly planted in our mind that he that loves the world makes himself an enemy of God, or, or what James 4.4 4 told us, the same thing. When one end is up, the other's down. You grow in your fear of God, that automatically decimates the fear of man that we carry with us. Or when it comes to the, the love test that John gives in 1 John. As we grow in our love for the Lord, our love for the world pales in comparison. But if we are chasing after the world, we cannot be chasing after God at the same time. It's impossible. You know, no matter how you feel in trying to be moral and wrap yourself, your rebellion up in religion, true and undefiled religion before God surrenders to and obeys God's Word, it's the fruit of regeneration. I mean, look, look again at what he said in verse 7. If the mindset is a fleshly one, it's hostile towards God, it is not subject to the law of God. Boy, here's a dirty word to the world. Submission. Submission. Paul says that this one is not subject to the law of God. Not only does he not want to, but he can't. He's not able to do so. The term is dunamai. He has no ability, no capability. It's to have power, whether it's by virtue of one's own ability and resources. What we have here in verse 7 is the doctrine of total depravity that comes into play. Man left to himself is totally unable. He doesn't want to submit to God, and he can't. No capacity. No room However, in biblical theology for bootstrap theology, where I can if I think I can, muscle through it. If we spend time studying Galatians 5, one thing we find is that the arm of the flesh is going to fail us every time. Just study Galatians 5, works of the flesh cannot accomplish what the fruit of the Spirit accomplishes in the life of the believer. So in this first class that Paul is talking about, verses 5 to 8, his thinking skewed, his state is skewed, his religion is skewed. Fourthly, his present condition, verse 8. Verse 8 is kind of a wrap-up. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. He repeats the substance of verse 7 in very personal form. He is not able to please God, to win His favor, to win approval. Back in chapter 7 and verse 5, Paul said that while we were in the flesh, that's past tense, as unbelievers, we were all fleshy. While we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. Our only ability was works of the flesh which produces death, left to ourselves. After all, how can he or she please God since he or she is hostile to God and doing everything possible to resist and trample down his just law? So we got two classes, two groups here. The flesh and the Spirit. Unbelievers and believers. Go back again to verse 5 if you would. We were told that the flesh sets their minds on things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Now, we ran over to Galatians 5 earlier to see the things of the flesh. Let's go back there to see the things of the Spirit. 
that is only produced in believers because we cannot get the work of the Spirit in our lives without the Spirit's residence. Galatians 5, verse 22. Here's the but, the contrast to the works of the flesh. Galatians 5, 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit... Let us also walk by the Spirit. So the Christian is not merely religious. There are a lot of believer, uh, unbelievers that are religious. But the religious Christian is mindful of the things of God. Their mind is set on what honors and praises and puts him on display. What does God love? That needs to be what I love. Remember that in the Christian race, growth in holiness is renewal of the mind. That's a large part of our sanctification process, renewing our minds. You know, friends, you're going to keep falling into the same potholes of sin and temptation if you're not changing your thinking because you've got to change your thinking to change the actions. Thoughts are real deals. Paul highlights it here in our text. As believers, we're now learning to think biblically and godly about life, which we didn't give a rip about in our pre-conversion state. We can now think Christ's thoughts as we have His mind revealed in Scripture. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I looked for a a snippet, and you can't read a snippet from 1 Corinthians 2. It's the whole deal. Listen to Paul. He says, When I came to you, brethren, I didn't come with superiority of speech or of wisdom proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling. In my message, my preaching... We're not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power. You know, Paul didn't come trained in all the rhetoric of the world. He came in the power of the Spirit. So that your faith wouldn't rest in the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature, a wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, who are passing away. But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory, the wisdom which none of the rulers of this age have understood, for if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. You know, the wisdom of God makes no sense of the wisdom of the world. But just as it is written, things which eye has not seen, ear has not heard, which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love Him. For to us... Paul speaking of the saints, the believers, those indwelt by the Spirit. To us, God revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. Now we've received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. There's the verse we referred to earlier, verse 14. But the natural man doesn't accept the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they're spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual, notice that, not he that's of the flesh, but of the Spirit. He that's spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he would instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ? You know, for those that have received the uh, smartphone notes app of uh, assumptions, we get in trouble when we start... Uh, assuming and questioning people's motives. We can't know somebody's heart, Paul says here, unless we ask him. 
right? Pride assumes, humility asks questions. Is this what you mean, brother so-and-so, sister Sally? It's the same principle here in the spiritual realm. We cannot know the mind of Christ without the resident Holy Spirit who moved holy men of God and they wrote down the very mind of Christ. We know how God thinks because He told us in the Bible. It's clear. The spiritual one, the one that's a Christian, sets his mind on the things of the Spirit. You know, the the believer is contrast with the unbeliever, the spiritual with the fleshy. You know, you look back at verse 6 again of Romans 8. The mind set on the flesh is death. But what does the mind set on the Spirit lead to? Life and peace. Doesn't get any better than that. Life and peace. Born again by the work of the Spirit and changed from our status of spiritual death to spiritual life. We are now at peace with God, not at enmity with Him. And now that we are at peace with God, we can experience the peace of God. Verse 7 even implies that the believer leads a life submitted to the law of God, which the unbeliever doesn't care about, not able to. Now, we're not perfectly practicing the law of God. We're not perfectly obeying, but there sure is change in direction where we now love the law that we once despised and we desire to obey and follow Jesus being submitted to Him. So our thinking has changed. Our status has changed. That's the contrast between the flesh and the spirit, the believer and the unbeliever. The word peace in our text, as Martin Lloyd-Jones points out, corresponds to the points of verse 7 step by step. He says, the natural man, the carnal man, is enmity against God, is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be, but of the Christian you say at once that he... He can be subject to it. He is subject to it, and he desires to be subject to it, and he goes out of his way to subject himself to the law of God. In other words, as Jesus says, he hungers and thirsts after righteousness. He desires to keep the commands which God has given his children. So, dear Christian, is your mind, is your heart set on the things of the Spirit of God? Are you moving towards righteousness and not away from it? It's not perfection, but there sure is a change in our direction. You might notice uh, your bulletin insert that you can take home and have for tea time this afternoon talks about, uh, I mentioned the phrase in the introduction about Jonathan Edwards' religious affections. Go through a study and then set up a coffee chat time with your pastor. Love to do so to answer questions. Religious affections that we're talking about here in Romans 8. Not a perfect practice of them, but they are present. If there is a love for God, if there is an obedience of life, is there, if there's a desire for the glory of God, you've got to ask yourself the question, where'd that come from? That didn't, le- that didn't come from me left to myself. That must indicate the Spirit's residence in my life. So you've got the flesh contrasted with the Spirit, the believer and the unbeliever contrasted. Verses 9 to 11 is the testimony of that true believer. Maybe we could uh, just talk about the tenses of the true believer's experience, past, present, and future. In the past tense, you've got verse 9. He says, You are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. What changed in our life at, at at the crossroads of conversion? We didn't have the Spirit, now we've got the Spirit. It's a glorious change that's taken place. Verse 9 
makes very clear, clearer than any other verse in the whole chapter, the absolute contrast between the two groups. Either you're controlled by the sinful flesh or you're living in accordance of the Holy Spirit. It applies to every Christian, not just the super-Christian. Every Christian is spiritual. So there's no doctrine here for the carnal Christian. You follow the apostle's ruthless logic. He says here, if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you don't belong to Christ. And if you belong to Christ, you've got the Spirit. And if you have the Spirit of Christ, you won't be controlled by the flesh. Just follow his logic. Regardless of one's profession, what characterizes the person? Is it works of the flesh or fruit of the Spirit? He says here in verse 9 that we are not in flesh but in spirit. We've been lifted out of our former sinful fleshly state and into the realm of the spirit. We are in the spirit and the spirit is in us where he's directing life, not the flesh. You see, our status has changed, not just our beliefs. We live in the spirit. If I could quote Lloyd-Jones again, he said, it's not that a man just changes his beliefs and no more. No, he, he was in the realm of the flesh and he is now in the realm of the Spirit. He was dominated by the flesh before and governed by it. He is now in a realm which is governed and controlled and dominated by the Spirit. And friends, we can't make that change of ourselves. It's something God does. You're similar to what Paul had said in, back in Romans 5. We are no longer under the reign of sin unto death, but we are under the reign of God's grace in Christ. Grace says God did it. This realm of the Spirit, which is our life. And did you notice that little phrase, if indeed? That's a big if that none of us can answer but the individual. If your life bears no evidence of the Spirit's sanctifying work, regardless of what you claim, regardless of what you profess, you're not a Christian. He makes it clear and unambiguous. Either you're of the flesh or of the Spirit. So in verse 9, you are not of the flesh but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. One doesn't have the Spirit of Christ, he doesn't belong to him. We used to not have the Spirit, now we do. Praise God for the indwelling spirit, the enabler of the Christian life. How about our present state, verse 10? He follows it up with, If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. Now, don't get off track here when he says, If Christ is in you. We've been talking about being in Christ. And the, Bi- the New Testament speaks in two ways, that we're in Christ and Christ is in us. Just get over it. It talks in both ways. That's our present state. We're united to Christ by faith and the Spirit of Christ dwells within. Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin. What does that mean? Go back to chapter 6 for a a, a little reminder because it's been a week or two or a month or two. 6.11 Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. Verse 12, I'd remind you, is when Paul first starts giving the imperatives. He starts giving commands to those that are in Christ. This change that has taken place where we're no longer slaves of our sin, where we have to obey it. He said, don't let it reign. Do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Our mortal bodies have been desperately affected by sin. That's how we sin. God had said at the beginning, 
but the day that you eat of the forbidden fruit, you will surely die. And man did immediately spiritually die, but he lived on in the flesh for a while. Think of this every time you and I are hacking up a lung sick, or we get the cancer diagnosis, or any other disease of these bodies. It's a reminder that, that's theological. We wouldn't have any disease at all without sin. Because once sin came, then death came. And the body hasn't finished dying yet, even though it's decaying, get more holes in it the longer we live. It's affected by sin. Later on in our chapter, verse 23, 823, we ourselves, he, he just talked about how the, the creation is groaning, waiting for the curse to be lifted. Well, it's not just the external creation to us. He says, we ourselves... Having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. You know, we look forward to the Lord's day when we get to gather with the saints. We hold in common the same salvation, the same gospel, the same Christ of the gospels of Scripture. But we are, our, our worship is tainted today. The willing is not always there. And the carrying out in perfect obedience definitely isn't there. But we have been saved to sin no more, and once we are glorified, it does finally lose its effect. Right now, the body is dead because of sin. The body is the source of our continuing troubles and struggles. Our physical bodies have the seeds of literal death in them and will eventually cease to live. Paul had already told us in chapter 6, verse 23, that the wages, the price to be paid for sin is what? Death. Wages and is death. Physical and spiritual. But praise God, we're alive because of righteousness. Notice that if again keeps showing up. If Christ is in you, then you're alive. Paul's saying that if the Spirit indwells you, verse 9, and the human spirit is alive and can be fulfilled delightfully obeying, where we're putting into practice through the Holy Spirit the inspired Scriptures, the law of God. Now we can do what we couldn't do in our pre-Holy Spirit indwelling days. Now we can obey. We are not fleshly minded, we're spiritual minded. In uh, Colossians 1, verse number 24, Colossians 1, 24, the apostle said, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake and in my flesh, I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. We were just finished the book of Acts in our scripture reading this morning. And in the flesh, Paul was finishing, filling up the afflictions meant for Christ. And since he preached the gospel, he was in house arrest. He's been in prison. He'll go to prison again. He'll die. That's what he's saying to the Colossians. Of this church, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the Word of God. That is, the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations but has now been manifested to His saints to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. What is the mystery of the Gent among the Gentiles? Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. When you read mystery in the New Testament, you are reading about stuff that Old Testament saints knew no details. It's a sovereign secret until it's revealed many times by the Apostle Paul. The Old Testament revealed Messiah was coming, but not that he'd actually live in each member of his redeemed church. Spirit indwelling that came... At Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. Though we're still carrying out this hunk of dead flesh, 
that's as good as dead, the Spirit made us alive to what we used to be dead to. We're alive to God. We're alive to Scripture. We're alive to the Spirit in others' lives. I like how James Montgomery Boyce put it. He said, first, his is a question of application, consideration for you. He said, first, is God real to you? Consider that. I don't mean do you understand everything about God and His ways. Of course you do not, for you'll never understand God completely. I simply mean, dear friend, is God real to you? When you pray, do you know that you're really praying to Him and that He's listening to you and will answer you? When you worship Him in church, is it a real God that you're worshiping? Second question. Is the Bible a meaningful and attractive book to you? Now, I don't mean do you understand everything you read there. Obviously, you do not. But does it, does it seem to be right when you read it? Are you attracted to it? Do you want to know more? Third question. Are you drawn to other Christians? Do you want to be with them? Do you enjoy their fellowship? Do you sense how much you and they have in common? If God is not real to you, If the Bible is not attractive, and if you are not drawn to other believers, why do you think you're a Christian? Probably you're not. On the other hand, if these things are true of you, you should be encouraging them and press on in following after Christ. Past tense, we didn't have the Spirit. Present, Christ is in us. Future, verse 11. Romans 8, 11. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Verse 11 spells out more verse 10. Dwelling in you. We saw the Spirit indwelling in verse 9. To live, to inhabit In 1 John 4.13, John says, By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us because He's given us of His Spirit. Let's let Jesus interpret Paul, shall we? Go back to John 14 for a moment. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John 14, Jesus hadn't gone away yet, but He's telling them He's going. John 14, 15, he says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. After a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live. You will also live. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, what then has happened that you are going to disclose yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, my Father will love him, and we will come to him, notice this, and make our abode with him. That's the dwelling that Paul is talking about, the inhabiting of the saint. He abides with you and will be in you. Friends, it is so crucial to see the Holy Spirit was the divine agent of Christ's resurrection. And just as He lifted Jesus out of physical death, gave Him life, gave life to His mortal body, so the Spirit dwells in believers, gives new life both now and forever. Now, we're guaranteed the future resurrection. This, this mortal must put on immortality, Paul told the Corinthians. And the significance of then affects now. The life is not just for then. Just think of it. If you're a Christian, you are right now experiencing eternal life. You don't have to die to get it. 
It's going to be much better then, but... So the Holy Spirit gives life. This is not just the eschatological end of the age talk. It's not an either or, but both and. Because of the future is so guaranteed, so is now's work of the Spirit in our life. Calvin understood this to refer to the continual operation of the Spirit by which he gradually mortifies the remains of the flesh and renews us, renews in us the heavenly life. The heavenly life today that will characterize us for eternity. So we've seen contrast between two groups of people. You got those who live in accordance with the flesh and those who live in accordance with the Spirit. What do they think about? What are their minds set on, the desires of the heart? Is it the flesh or the Spirit? Well, the ultimate end of the flesh leads to death, the ultimate end of the spirit leads to life and peace. They've got contrasting attitudes toward God. One is hostile toward God, the other is receptive towards God. Their attitude towards God's standards, the flesh does not submit to God's law, whereas the spiritual seeks to fulfill God's law. Concerning ability, Those who are according to the flesh in their unredeemed state are unable to submit to God's law, but the spirit indwelt believer is able to submit to it. Unbeliever cannot please God, but the believer is. So we've got here two groups, not three. No perpetual carnal Christian. You've got spiritual minded believers and fleshly minded unbelievers. So is there a conflict within? There's definitely a conflict between the flesh and the spirit. So what's directing your life, dear friend? Is it the flesh or the spirit? It could be that there is no power over sin because of no spirit. And you need to come to Christ today. Use that bulletin insert this week and ask the Spirit of God to direct you as to what your condition, what your state is. You know, the presence of the Holy Spirit is a critical factor. So critical it determines whether a person is a true believer and his residence is clearly shown in his transformative work in our lives. Somehow I came across this illustration Corey Ten Boom gives. She said, I've got a glove here in my hand. The glove cannot do anything by itself, but when my hand is in it, it can do many things. True, it is not the glove, but my hand in the glove that acts. We're gloves. It's the Holy Spirit in us who is the hand who does the job. We have to make room for the hand so that every finger is filled. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we have been going verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and from chapter 6 on have been seeing the sanctified life of the believer. We saw in the earlier chapter that sin is no longer our taskmaster where we are slaves to obey its lust. We no longer have to obey it, and though at times we do. Help us to slay residual fleshly desires in our heart and so assure that we're in Christ. Help us to put off every sin and to crucify it afresh. We pray, O God, for the moralist who professes to know you but is bankrupt in fruit of the Spirit, that you would draw them to repentance and faith. Thank you that you are more willing to forgive sinners than sinners are to confess their sins. Continue your work of drawing people to salvation and sanctifying your people for your glory, we pray. Amen.